Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Bob Kadanak. I'll let my colleagues introduce themselves. Uh, Ron Moscona um, from the uh, Dorsey London office. Jamie Nafsiger from here in the Minneapolis office. So thank you all for joining us. We have a full house today, and we have a very full content-laden uh, presentation. So you will uh, bear with us as we try to get as much done as possible. Um, I would ask you to remember to sign in on the, on the uh, green sheets there for your CLE credit. Um, Jamie will be reading at the undisclosed point in time the New York <laughs> secret code. Um, I, I, I have a feeling that we're going to be uh, uh, fully occupied through our time here, but I will uh, offer that um, at, <clears throat> once we finish this, we will stay around uh, for questions if you like, and we can do it in a group setting or, or we'll just be here afterwards um, if you would like to approach us individually. So, um, you know, we all, we all know what the advent of big data has done to uh, our, our economy, our society, our life. Um, it, it's big business, and it's, it's as, the, as the slide notes, it's, it's got some risks to it. Um, so <clears throat> one of the tensions I think that we see, and I'm sure you do as well, is um, while there's a, the sort of tendency to, well, let's limit the amount of, of data we get and collect so we can limit the risk, but that's oftentimes uh, not a practical solution. Um, so what we help our clients try to do is, is mitigate that risk by having the, you know, policies and procedures in place. Um, and there's, there's no way kind of not to be part of this. Uh, and there is uh, perhaps no larger event looming for those of us in this field than uh, May 25th of next year when GDPR uh, becomes effective. Um, as you all know, uh, um, I'm sure that protects all data that relates to individuals. It doesn't have to be confidential or secret. Um, and uh, even if, if someone voluntarily makes information available, it still must be protected under the GDPR. Um, and the, the concept is a reasonable expectation of privacy. That is a, an elusive term sometimes, and it's an evolving term. Um, but <clears throat> What we're going to talk about today at, uh, frankly, a fairly high level, uh, but there'll be some times when we're able to get into some detail, is uh, what kind of companies are subject to GDPR, what's the, the legal basis that one must have if you're going to process data, and what are the fundamentals of compliance, what kinds of operational and process changes might you likely see to be GDPR compliant. Um, and I'm sorry, that was Jamie's, but Oh, go that's ahead. fine. Yeah. yeah, that's great. So um, I just wanted to make a couple points before we uh, get into the meat of this. And that is that um, the EU uses some different language than we're used to in the US. So I just wanted to define a few of the terms so that the rest of what we're going to talk about will make sense. And the first one is on this slide, which is the word processing. So for those who work in privacy in the US, you know, we usually talk about what information do you collect about somebody? What personal information? What do you use that information for? And who do you share it with? Those are kind of all rolled into the, term, the concept of processing in the EU. The, the technical definition is automated and non-automated operations performed on personal data. So pretty much anything you're doing on a website and then lots of other things that we'll be talking about. Um, in terms of the operational and process changes, the, there probably will be quite a few, and it will be heavily involving your IT departments. Some of you may be far into it, and some are just getting started. Um, but there will be not only just changes on paper, and we'll go into that more. Policies, both internal and external, will need to be revised. And then in terms of contractual changes, um, you probably, if you operate a website, you probably already have a contract with Google Analytics, maybe a credit card processor, whoever's helping with the behind the scenes aspects of your website. 
Those will need to include new required terms. So a lot of uh, agreements will need to be redone to include the new GDPR terms. Now, if you're familiar with this, there's a group called the Article 29 Working Party. And they um, are an advisory body on EU privacy. They've already been issuing letters to Facebook and WhatsApp about some of the privacy practices of those organizations that they're concerned about. And so far, they seem pretty dissatisfied with the responses that they're receiving. So as Ron, or as Bob mentioned, May 25th um, next year, it's possible that those will be some of the companies that will be getting some of the first enforcement actions. It's interesting that they're already sending letters now, hopefully trying to get them to come into compliance. And then we'll talk about data subject rights. And that's another kind of different term for Americans. Um, a data subject just really means the person whose personal data is being collected. It doesn't have anything to do with what the subject of the data is. It's the person is the data subject. We'll also talk about um, data security. And we'll talk about the e-privacy regulation, which is actually a separate regulation from GDPR, but it's hotly contested and, and very active right now. Um, some of the goals that have been stated by the regulators in this e-privacy uh, regulation will be very troubling for US companies. And I heard that the amount of money being spent on lobbying about this is just astronomical. So we'll talk about it briefly, but there'll be more to come on that in the coming years. And soon. Um, we'll also talk about data transfer, which should be a familiar concept for people in terms of transferring personal data outside of the EU, and data breach, which we're familiar with from the US perspective, but now there are new requirements in Europe. So first of all, who is covered by GDPR? There's really kind of two different categories of um, companies that could be covered. The first is if your company has a presence in the EU. And here we come to some more terms that aren't familiar to us in the US, controller and processor. So the controller is basically the person who's running the show. It's like the website operator or the employer, whoever is making the decisions about what's happening. They, the technical definition is they determine the purposes and means of processing. The processor, on the other hand, is um, processing personal data on behalf of the controller. So if you're running Google Analytics on your website, you would be the controller and Google Analytics would be the processor. Now, some companies are going to be both a controller and a processor, depending on the circumstances. And some processors might also use processors. So there's this concept of sub-processor, which isn't actually in the regulation, but there, um, there are some requirements that if you're a vendor and you're going to use other processors, you actually have to get prior written permission from the controller. Anyway, that's kind of a long uh, intro, but if you're a controller and you have an office, you're resident in one of the member states of the EU, then you're covered by GDPR. If you're a processor say, and they're in the EU, that's just, you're also covered by GDPR. The other category, and this is sort of new for some American companies that may have felt like they were outside of previous regulations, if you're processing data involving a data subject, in other words, a person in the EU, even if you're processing it outside of the EU, you're covered by GDPR. And if you're offering goods or services to a person in the EU, you're covered by GDPR. And if you're monitoring data subjects' behavior online or otherwise, you're covered by GDPR. So you can see pretty much anyone that has employees or a website that's selling goods into the EU is definitely going to be covered. I, I might, might just uh, mention one thing is that, that uh, under the previous law, um, or the, the law that exists today, uh, um, pretty much all of the obligations uh, that the law imposes are imposed on the uh, controller um, of the uh, um, uh, personal data, uh, whereas the GDPR uh, takes a broader approach and uh, it does uh, define um, clause by clause, provision by provision, uh, which um, uh, obligations apply to controllers and which on processes, but about 80% of the obligations under GDPR apply both to the controllers and the processors, and that's a big change. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ron. So now you've decided under our last slide that you are subject to GDPR. Now what do you need to do? Um, 
In terms of the operational changes you might need to make, I'm just going to cover it really briefly and then we'll talk more about it. But a lot of it um, will relate to setting up your systems so that you can respond to requests from data subjects. So if a person asks you, for instance, to give, you access, give them access to all the personal data you have about them, even if you don't disagree that you would like to give them that access, if your computer systems aren't set up to allow you to provide that information to them, then you won't be ready and you won't be in compliance. So some of it is sort of behind the scenes, getting your data organized and getting your computer systems to give out the information that you're going to be required to give out. You might have to think about where your data is being stored um, as we talk about data transfers between countries. You might have to figure out how you're going to anonymize certain data. So can you do you have the, you know, uh, IT capabilities to do that. And then some of the other requirements relate to record keeping of your processing activities. So that may be a new thing you're going to have to figure out how to do and start making part of your business practices. Your policies will probably need to be revised, including your privacy policies, your data retention policies, data access, um, policies related to international transfers, security, and data breach. And then um, in terms of revision of your third party contracts, as I mentioned, there are standard or there are clauses that you will be required to have in any agreement, if you're the controller, in any agreements you have with your processors. Now there's been talk about some of the regulators putting out some standard clauses that we could use, which would be just excellent if they would, but unfortunately they're not out yet. So at this point, we're drafting um, to help clients get their agreements up to date, um, you know, to be compliant with GDPR. And I'm going to turn it over to Ron. Right. I mean, um, I'm turning now to the uh, uh, bit where I'm going to um, scare you a bit, uh, and that's part of uh, what GDPR is all about. Um, I mean, one of the there were a number of motivations to introducing this law. Um, the European Union had uh, data protection laws um, for. I think about 30 years, it's not new. Um, when I started practicing in this area, it was a complete dead letter in the law. I mean, it was officially, no one took it seriously at all. Now, they, they reintroduced um, certain measures and uh, they, 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 a new act was introduced in the UK in 98, um, uh, which was uh, kind of stepping it up a little bit to make it uh, uh, a regulation that is taken a little bit more seriously. And it has been taken a little bit more seriously um, in the last 15 years. Um, but uh, still, enforcement was um, pretty limited, uh, and uh, at, the, at the time when uh, the digital industry has been developing very rapidly and uh, becoming a, uh, a, very, a very kind of major feature of, of our lives and kind of the uh, uh, explosion of, uh, of intrusion into people's uh, uh, data through the, mainly uh, through the mobile devices and uh, other means and kind of... Uh, um, monitoring them and all that. As, as this was happening, um, still the, the, the law on data protection was kind of um, enforced, but um, uh, no serious action was ever taken against anyone, if you, except for a few penalties uh, uh, against, uh, uh, you know, in, in the cases of uh, serious uh, data breaches uh, or, or serious breaches of anti-spamming laws. That was about it. Uh, one of the main reasons for introducing GDPR was to um, um, ratchet up the uh, enforcement powers. And, and then this slide would, would basically gives a, a brief uh, uh, a summary of, of, of the enforcement powers uh, that exist under the uh, new uh, regulations, and they come in, in kind of three parts. Um, um, investigatory powers, in, uh, the ability to, to, to go into your business and require information um, and, 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 and acquire um, all of that. Um, the, the, the heart of, of, of enforcement, generally in Europe, certainly in the UK, in, in, in various areas such as financial regulations and other areas of, of, uh, of regulation, and is, is in, in enforcement orders. So, I mean, the, the main tool that will be used um, is issuing orders. I mean, that's how antitrust regulators work. That's how, um, you know, um, stock exchange regulators work. They, 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 they don't prosecute so much as, as they issue enforcement orders. And these enforcement orders are the real tool with which um, uh, companies have to, I mean, companies like Facebook and Google, that will be the everyday tool that they deal with. They will get an enforcement order. They will get lawyers to negotiate it for, for 10 years. And that is, that is going to be the main thing. And other companies, more, more smaller maybe, will, 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 will also kind of 
uh, face these kind of things. And, 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 and ultimately, there could be prosecutions or uh, in various ways, there could be prosecutions through the courts or the regulators. There, there will be regulators in each, there are regulators in each member state in the European Union, but also there will be a super regulator um, uh, with, uh, with its own significant enforcement powers for the whole of the EU. They will have the uh, power, amongst other things, to impose penalties, a very high um, um, penalties. Generally speaking, these are equivalent to the uh, level of penalties that uh, antitrust regulators can impose. So we're talking about, you know, up to 4% of the, uh, the, the, the global annual turnover, turnover of the company, um, if it's more than 20 million or 20 million as a, as a, as a kind of level. So, so these are potentially high. And of course, no one suggests that uh, for every minor um, uh, breach of, uh, of the law, um, there will be any penalties. I think the penalties are going to be the last thing that uh, regulators are going to use. They're going to use investigatory powers and enforcement orders much more. So these are reserved for egregious cases or for Google and Facebook if, if they want to make a, a case out of them or other big kind of high-profile companies. So enforcement is important. Um, now, um, uh, kind of delving into really sinking our teeth into some of the fundamentals as to what, what, is, what is it all about. Um, GDPR as a regulate, regulatory regime um, works uh, naturally at, at, at various levels. It's not a single issue. Um, uh, it's a very thick piece of le legislation. Uh, uh, it does, it, it's not a single focus kind of regulation. It works at various levels. And at the very fundamental level, the first step is um, uh, what, what, does it tell us wh which data we can, we can process? What can we do with it? I mean, what, what does it say about these things? And, and, and one thing to understand about GDPR is that in most respects, it doesn't tell us which um, um, data we can collect, which data we can process, and for what purposes we can process. It's, it, it exists generally at a higher level than that. Um, what, but what it does say at the uh, very basic level is that processing has to be lawful. Now, it can be, it is quite restrictive in the sense that the, 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 uh, you, you have to identify the lawful basis for uh, processing uh, under one of the category, categories that are listed in the legislation. Now, for, in most uh, situations, um, you can rely, and most, the best, way to, uh, the best uh, approach is to rely on your legitimate interest, because there is a basket case of relying on your, your legitimate interest which could be a commercial interest to process data as long as that doesn't uh, um, unduly infringe on people's privacy expectations. It's a very loose kind of category, but it's very practical and quite uh, important that you can use it. There are also other, other much more specific categories. For example, uh, I'm using this data in order to comply with the law. So take the, the very simple example of HR um, data. If you, what is the basis for you to process your, the data of your employees? You have to run their payroll. You have to pay their taxes. You have to, to, to comply with records keeping under the employment and tax laws. So you rely on your compliance with law um, um, as, as the legal basis. You also rely on an alternative legal basis of, 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 of complying with your ob contractual obligations, your contractual obligations with your employees. You have to run the, the, the keep the databases of your of, the, of your employees for that purpose. But for many other purposes, relying on your legitimate interest is quite important. That takes us to the um, very important issue of consent. Um, and, and, and again, one of the things about GDPR is that it moves away from consent being the, at, at the very heart of data protection. I think there was a realization that it doesn't really work because um, people will just collect consents and do whatever they want. And, and that was pretty much the reality under the existing law. And GDPR aimed um, um, to move away from that a little bit. Uh, consent is one of the um, bases, a very important basis, on which uh, one can process data. And it's great, and we'll talk about consent a little bit more uh, in a little bit more detail later, but it is one of the bases. You don't have to rely on consent. And, 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 the, exa and, the, and, the, and the great example is there's no point in relying on consent for processing your HR data. And there are plenty of companies out there that are collecting consent forms from employees to process their HR data. This is, pretty, this is pretty, pretty much wrong. You shouldn't rely on your, 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 on your employees' consent. That's not the, wrong, the, the right uh, basis to, to rely on. Uh, consent is very important in some respects, but it's not the be-all and all of, 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 of data protection. Well, even in an employment situation, Ron, is, isn't there almost a presumption that you can't, uh, you 
asking an employee for consent isn't willfully given. Yeah, yeah. Consent, it, it, generally speaking, and not just for legal processing, but for other purposes, um, particularly in Germany, but increasingly throughout the EU, um, the uh, approach is that uh, a consent uh, obtained from an employee doesn't meet the requirements of free um, um, and uh, uh, free consent that, that, that is required under the GDPR. So, you know, it's, it's a good example where consent is, is, is not a particularly useful um, uh, thing to rely on. Of course, in other, in other circumstances, consent is quite important. So th this is about the really <coughs> basic levels of, of, uh, um, of, of compliance. And there are other things like... Um, 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 uh, transparency, for example, which is very important. These are the things that kind of lie at the heart of, uh, of, of what is this is all about. Um, another very important uh, issue, which, on which we will talk a little bit later, is uh, about um, um, protecting the data from uh, um, data breaches. And uh, as we are going to talk about it a little bit more later, and I'm not going to talk about a lot, a lot about this issue at the moment, but. Uh, uh, data security is obviously um, part of the reason for, for, the, for the need for data protection, and one of the major issues that, that need to be, uh, we need to be concerned about. Um, so I mentioned um, uh, transparency, and that's the, the first point uh, in, in this slide. Uh, privacy policies, um, privacy policies is an American term, actually. It is used uh, uh, around the world and used in, in Europe, but the, the, the technical uh, term in, 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 in Euro language is, is uh, processing notification. Um, the processing notification, the, the requirement of transparency is to tell people whether you collect the data from these people or you collect them from someone else, when you are processing um, personal data of, uh, of individuals, uh, you need to notify them of the processing and very, very importantly, uh, importantly the purpose of the processing. So, uh, and Jamie mentioned that one of the things that people need to get right is the privacy policies. And one of the things that were privacy policies um, in, I would say, at least 95% of the cases, and that might be a, a serious understatement, uh, is that they treat it like terms and conditions. Um, and it completely isn't, for, for at least for, for, for EU purposes, this is a notification. It's much more similar to a prospectus, if you like. It's a smaller document, of course. We're not talking about, about a prospectus. But, but in, in a prospectus, you're not, you're not putting language like it's, a, it's terms and conditions with the investors. You agree to this, and you acknowledge that this. This is not what you do in a prospectus, do you? Um, you, you tell them about the business. You tell them how you compile, compile, compile the, uh, the financials. The same, the same thing, the, 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 the privacy policy or the, the, the notification, um, um, the, the, the processing notification, uh, is a requirement to tell uh, people um, what data you're processing, who is responsible for it, uh, who's in charge, and very importantly, uh, what's the purpose of the processing. And the, the purpose is a key uh, requirement in, in uh, GDPR. Um, the uh, identifying the purpose and sticking to that purpose uh, and avoiding a situation where you collect data in order to process a transaction with the, uh, um, uh, with the data subject and then using that data in order to do something completely else, for, for example, to, uh, for marketing purposes or for, for other things, and not telling them about it, that's one of the things that, um, and it could, in some situations, it can be pretty serious. Um, if, if, for example, if, if you're going to collect data for one purpose and then use it in order to decide um, which people are, you're going to offer uh, an insurance coverage and which people you're not, and not telling them about it, that is the kind of thing that, that GDPR uh, wants to avoid. And, and, and in this kind of junction, I, I might uh, point out another thing, um, which is kind of less important for this audience, but it is important to understand this le legislation. This is not necessarily or primarily about private organizations uh, processing data. GDPR is, um, I would say, primarily um, targeted at um, public um, um, agencies at public authorities. This is European legislation that tells governments and local authorities and police, of, uh, police forces and armies and all of these public authorities um, uh, how, how they need to deal with data. And they deal with an awful lot of data and they have an awful lot of powers. And this is uh, the fact that we're all here and, and this affects uh, private organizations. Of course, private organizations are, are important and they're part of the, of the picture. But uh, a lot of this is primarily about public authorities and how they should use our data. And a lot of the paranoia uh, around that is not just paranoia about uh, Google and Facebook. It's paranoia about your local authority and about your police force, about all these people who are collecting data and you know, dealing with it. 
Um, and I think it's, it's, it's kind of useful to keep in mind uh, if you think what this is all about. Um, so, um, very quickly, um, uh, a few other fundamentals. Data protection officer, I mean, actually, it brings, it's, 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 it's a relevant point. Uh, a data protection officer is a requirement that applies pretty much in two cases. It doesn't, it's, not, it's not a very broad requirement. Um, not everyone needs to have a, a data protection officer. If you're a, a public authority, you do need one. So that is the, the, the first requirement of the law. If you're a public authority, you have to have a data protection officer. Um, the, if you are as a private organization, the main purpose, uh, the main, the main uh, obligation to, to appoint a, a data protection officer is if you are engaged in, in uh, a kind of heavy duty monitoring of uh, people's behavior. Um, and that can apply to a lot of people, but of course it, it would not apply to also to a lot of other people. Um, EU representative, that's, that's a little bit of a sore uh, point, and it's an unresolved point because uh, it's an obligation um, that applies to uh, companies that do not have an establishment in the EU. Um, so if you are covered by the legislation, as Jamie mentioned earlier, because you are actually monitoring the activities of, uh, of EU um, individuals or you're targeting people and collecting um, data from people who are targeted by your website or by whatever it might be, um, then you have to appoint a, 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 a representative. A representative is basically a postal box uh, because that, that person or organization would be the person or organization in the EU uh, who people can knock on their door or file claims against and so forth. That is the purpose, is, kind of, is, is to have a, a presence in the EU uh, for enforcement purposes um, and for, for asserting data subject rights. Um, the, 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 sadly, I think, uh, and annoyingly, um, the, uh, uh, the, the only situation where you don't have to appoint a, a, a effectively a, a, a representative is where your processing is uh, uh, at negligible kind of lev levels or if it's, if it's only um, occasional. Now, if it's only occasional, you might not be fussed by the whole thing, but uh, for, for most people who are interested in, in, in compliance with data protection, their, their processing is not going to be occasional, or it would be difficult to, to argue that it is occasional. Uh, and in principle, they have to appoint a, a representative. I would expect um, some consultancies or companies or some you know, corporate secretarial services to, to start offering that as a service. Um, as far as I know, this hasn't happened yet. And, and uh, I, I don't have an answer to clients who are ask, asking me, do you know of anyone who uh, offers this service uh, to be a representative? Um, and it's not that simple because a representative has legal liability. So you have to give them uh, indemn indemnifications. Um, we'll talk about uh, transferring data outside of the EU um, later, so we'll skip that one now, but it, it, it is also one of the um, kind of fundamental issues. So <clears throat> we have a fairly onerous task ahead if indeed you find yourself having to comply with the GDPR. One, um, one note that we're also seeing is some of our clients are coming and saying, you know, I, I'm not covered by GDPR, but I am a vendor to a company that is, and they are asking me to certify that I will be GDPR compliant. So <clears throat> this can be a, a bit of a rude awakening. And the, the good news is you can, you can approach this in manageable steps, uh, and, and that's what we've been trying to help our clients do. I mean, the first piece, the privacy due diligence, just understanding what data, personal data, you collect, and where is it, where does it go, how long does it stay. Um, once you have your arms around that, then you can go about the process of, of maybe taking a fresh look at policies and procedures. Mm -hmm. what, what do we say about the data that we are collecting? What do we tell people? What do we advise them of the purpose of the, of the processing? Um, <clears throat> one of the key things about GDPR is not just requiring you to do or not do certain things, but uh, it, it, you will also be required to demonstrate in some fashion that you are in compliance with GDPR. So that, as Ron mentioned earlier, the uh, regulators will have audits. Uh, they maybe I would anticipate, fairly standard, just simple. Show us how you are, are able, if one of your data subjects says, I'd like to know 
what kind of data you have about me. I'd like to look at it. I want to make sure it's right. What's your, show us your process. How do you go about doing that? And as Jamie mentioned, that it, it probably the, you're going to have to have a much more in-depth understanding of the flow of data, uh, your systems that use it, and where it, it, where it resides. Um, <clears throat> that brings us to third-party vendors. Uh, I, I, you know, it's a two-way street. If, if, you are, if you have to be GDPR compliant, I think uh, you should be c careful about if you're uh, entrusting data, uh, personal data, to any vendors, you, you're going to ultimately be called upon to demonstrate that they uh, are, are carrying out the requirements because they're acting on your behalf. Um, <clears throat> so there's a couple of special categories that, that Ron can talk about that, uh, that, that we'll, we'll probably not spend a lot of time on, but we wanted you to see them so you're aware that, that actually not all data is created equal. Yeah, uh, and, uh, and I think that, that doesn't apply to everyone, but one thing that um, uh, is useful to remember is that uh, the level of compliance under GDPR, um, it, it, it does uh, reflect the level of risk. And uh, I mean, the GDPR uses that uh, fairly soft um, um, notion of, of, of high risk, and high risk, um, without uh, going into too much detail, um, uh, dictates uh, the level of compliance. And uh, specifically, as you can see in this, in this uh, um, slide, it, it, it is the test to whether you have to have, formally have to have a um, data protection impact assessment, basically a document that analyzes the risk and um, needs to be done professionally. Um, so essentially, you need to do that if there's a high risk. It also depends, uh, it also determines uh, the level of engagement with regulators and, and other things. Um, the kind of high-risk situations are listed here. Uh, automated uh, automated uh, profiling and uh, and processing is 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 a big one. Large scale, of course. Um, uh, systematic uh, monitoring of public areas. Those um, and I think it's a big big issue. It's becoming a big issue now with the uh, uh, face recognition and all of that. That would be a high-risk issue. Uh, these kind of uh, things uh, uh, flow into high risk. It's very difficult to determine, I think, in specific cases um, whether something is high risk or not. But it's a bit, you know, a bit like a camel. You know, you, you recognize one when you see it. May may, may be difficult to uh, to define. Um, the, the the other point about high risk is about, um, we call it sensitive data, the legislation actually calls it uh, special categories of data. The, the, the important thing about uh, these uh, categories of uh, uh, categories of data that is deemed to be highly personal um, or sensitive is that whereas you can, uh, I mean it's important in various respects, but one of the key issues is that what, whereas for processing generally you can rely on your legitimate interests. Um, for processing. You cannot rely on legitimate interest if you're going to process any of those categories. And by far, the most glaring, uh, glaringly important one is the first one, uh, health records. Uh, GDPR uh, and national law can be quite uh, prescriptive about who is entitled to access um, uh, health records. Uh, of course, your GP, of course, your, your physician, but who else? Um, and and there's, 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 there's very significant limitations. So whoever's in the business of, of healthcare would be uh, acutely aware. And of course, in, in, in areas like healthcare, this comes on top of confidentiality obligations and, and sometimes very complicated uh, confidentiality rules under national law in relation to, to um, uh, patient uh, uh, doctor um, uh, relationships. Um, but also, GDPR tends to be extremely um, um, uh, restrictive about that. Interestingly, you will see, and that's probably as a result of lobbying or, or other considerations, financial information is not one of those um, sensitive areas. So um, they're not, even though, but even though confidentiality um, um, obligations do apply to financial obligation, of course, uh, financial um, information. Um, okay. So. We're going to just move briefly to what duties do you have to data subjects? And, and then we'll also talk about what rights they have. So Ron talked about a processing notification, which uh, just describes what you're doing. Um, one of the interesting things for me, because I work with a lot of websites, and many of them have, you know, the average one now has probably 10 to 20 different third pieces or third party pieces of software operating on it, doing all different kinds of things. Some of them are profiling or this kind of tracking or behavioral advertising. Um, and one of the things that has to be in these processing notifications is you have to tell people if you are profiling them. And 
that, that otherwise it's similar to privacy policies we have now, but it has some additional categories. Ron also talked about the legal basis to collect or process the data. And after you do your assessment of all the data that Bob was talking about, you can then analyze which types of data do we have a legal, ba a lawful basis to process and which might we not and we need to do some things to get us into a more lawful condition. Um, there's really six different types of lawful basis um, you can rely on. Uh, three of them probably are most relevant for companies that are operating websites or we're talking about the internet consent Ron talked about. Um, the Article 29 working party that I talked about has basically said for behavioral advertising that consent is probably your only option. Um, you're not going to be able to rely on any of these other bases which are easier to um, meet. Another one is that it's necessary for the performance of a contract. And for somebody like me who writes website terms of use, I said, yes, this is great. We're going to have a contract and we'll be fine. Unfortunately, the word necessary has to be read into this. So they have an example where, say your website um, sells something and you, have, you collect people's shipping information to ship them the thing they're buying from you. And you also collect their credit card information so they can pay you for it. And you also collect information about their preferences so you can build a profile of them to advertise other things to them. Well, they say the shipping address and the credit card information, that's necessary. The profiling part isn't. So you're back into consent in that kind of situation. And then the legitimate interests that Ron was talking about is an is a important one too. It's more of a balancing test. And one of, a couple of things about that that they suggest is that you should document, if you're going to rely on that basis, that you should document your analysis of this balancing test. And there's a bunch of factors you have to look at that we don't have enough time to go into today. But you should document it for yourself, maybe with a legal memorandum, and then you also have to explain it to your data subjects. Like, we thought about this. We think our interests in doing this processing outweigh your freedoms, obviously. <laughs> you have to figure out some nice way to say that, and therefore, that's that we're going to go forward. Um, the other thing, and then once you've justified your basis, you have to limit what you're doing to that justified basis. The caveat to all of it is that EU uh, data subjects have an unconditional right to object to you using their information for direct marketing. So no matter which of these things you've done, they can always say, nope, I've decided, I've changed my mind, I've, I want to opt out of being, you know, used, of you using my information in that way. So there, there are, uh, there's a list of a number of, of, of uh, data subject rights, the rights of individuals, um, which, which function in, in several different ways. I mean, to some extent, these are substantive rights, the right to know what processing is happening about me. In other, way, in other respects, it's part of the enforcement powers, basically. Uh, alongside the, uh, uh, the regulators, uh, uh, GDPR uh, creates rights which can be used uh, basically as... as, as, as uh, uh, prequel to litigation, if you like, uh, as part of the enforcement um, uh, mechanism. Some of the rights are not absolute. Some are, as, as Jamie <coughs> rightly emphasized, um, uh, anti-spamming is, is an absolute thing. If you don't want to be subject to spamming, which is um, marketing communications, you can simply say, I don't want to, and that's it. There's no um, buts or ifs. Uh, on the other hand, the, the, the right to object to uh, the, the right of erasure, which, which, which is uh, very well known, or the right to object to processing, um, is, is a balancing um, um, issue as well. I mean, it, there's no automatic right to say, I don't want your insurance company processing my data. Um, it, 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 it depends on uh, to what extent the processing um, uh, affects the person's uh, um, pers uh, privacy interests and, uh, and, and expectations, and to what ex extent it is justified, for example, by the legal basis, whether it has to be done for legal purposes, whether it's for convenience and so forth. So some of these um, um, uh, rights are, are, are more kind of uh, um, uh, judgmental than others or, or subject to, uh, uh, to balancing acts. Um, but there are quite a few of them. And, and, and as Bob says, one of the things about compliance is uh, putting in place the processes and being able to demonstrate that you are uh, capable of, of, of responding to these things. And you have processes in place, particularly co large companies that 
can't just uh, get the GC to do everything. Um, and that's part, part, partly this is about being able to deal with data subject rights and data subject requests, as we call them. Um, we talked quite a bit about consent, and uh, I'm not going to uh, uh, repeat, um, but uh, bear in mind, consent doesn't always work. It's not um, always the best thing to do. In some cases, it is necessary and essential, but it's full of holes. It's much more difficult than you think. You can't have consent as part of your privacy policy. You can't have consent as part of your terms and conditions. Consent has to be uh, given freely. Um, and it has to be uh, given in relation to a specific uh, purpose that you um, state for which you request consent. And very, very importantly, yeah. consent can be with withdrawn. So everyone who relies on consent to do anything, including, for example, for sending marketing communications or for doing this or doing that, um, in, in terms of systematically, it quite, can be difficult to rely on consent because when people withdraw their consent, you have to deal with that. You have to follow through. And one of the difficult things about compliance is the follow-up following through with things that you want to actually do. You want to, to respect people's uh, right to opt out, but you have to have the systems to make sure that it actually happens. And as we know as, as consumers, it doesn't always happen. Um, so, you know, consent is, is, can be problematic in many ways. On the other hand, it is still a very important thing, just like um, um, uh, tran um, transparency. Consent can be important in many, many situations. So, again, sort of panning back, as, as perhaps you sit there and say, oh my goodness, this is really onerous. This is very prescriptive. Why? I mean, what a headache. Yes. Um, but ultimately, it's GDPR is not that much different than basic good information governance when you think about it. Um, <clears throat> companies ought to know why are we collecting and processing and disseminating personal data. What's the, why are we doing this? Uh, who should have access? Who's responsible for making sure that this data it remains secure? Uh, the IT security and the anonymization piece, you can g spend a fair amount of time getting into the execution of that, but conceptually, um, it, it is a, one of the pillars of, of obviously GDPR, but also good information governance. So, <clears throat> Things like, you know, the service providers that you, we all use, and uh, we, we, we spend a fair amount of time with our service providers making sure that we understand what security they use. Uh, and the flip side of it is, I, I would venture to guess that many of you in this room, your, your companies, have received requests uh, because you, are, you provide services or, or, or other things to someone who's saying, I want to know what your security process is. Show me what your policies and procedures are. Uh, and again, GDPR, you will see, I'm confident, as more and more companies become uh, aware of it and uh, attempt to comply with it, they're, they're going to turn around and look at their vendors for assistance on that. Uh, data maintenance and cleansing, again, just good information governance, probably more critical under GDPR. It's, there's some teeth to this now where there maybe wouldn't be under just normal information governance. Um, and we've said it before, but we can't overemphasize the importance of, of having a procedure for responding to data subjects' requests. Okay, so what kind of documents do you need in connection with your compliance? Um, consent form. So Ron mentioned that this is different from your privacy policy or your terms of use. You need to have a separate thing that uh, has specific information in it if you're seeking people's consent. A data processing agreement would be the agreement you would have with your vendors, the one that has this required written terms. Data exporting is pretty self-explanatory, but you'd be documenting your safeguards that you're using in connection with having data leave the EU. Joint controller agreements are kind of interesting because in some cases, two companies might really be controllers. They might both be deciding what's happening with the data. So what happens then? Well, you can have an agreement where you agree on your roles vis-a-vis -vis each other, but you, um, you have to notify the data subjects about this joint controller um, arrangement, and they can still go after either of you. So you can't really fully delegate your compliance to somebody else. You're still going to be on the hook to be complying, even if you have a joint controller situation. Privacy policy statements is what we're familiar with. Um, other internal policies may need to change as well. 
I'm going to skip this in the interest of time, but just make a couple points. One is, um, you know, data protection by design was a big deal in the U.S. a few years ago, and it's implemented in GDPR. Um, one of the couple things about this, one is repurposing of data. So that we're already getting that question of, well, if, our, if we're asking um, for these types of consents or we're explaining that we're using data for this, but then later we want to use it for something else, what do we have to do? Well, GDPR kind of tells you about that and um, it's going to relate to how broad were your initial consents and there are some limits on how broad they can be. And then what, late, what lawful basis are you using? And there will be different things you'll have to do if you want to repurpose data depending on those things. The other thing is, with some of the regulatory guidance, it's pretty clear that using data brokers is going to be incredibly difficult. So if you're currently using data brokers, um, you need to look at this right now because it's, um, it may be a big change and uh, they're going to have to have a direct relationship with your customers, which has never happened before, and uh, will require a lot of changes. So. Well, one, one, one more thing about operational requirements. I think uh, one of the key takeaways from GDPR uh, is anonymization and, or, or the unpronounceable uh, notion of uh, pseudonymization. I managed to say Very that. Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, I can't overemphasize how important it is. And, and as Bob says, and I think quite correctly, um, this is not just about making life difficult for uh, organizations. It actually reduces risk a lot. Uh, and, and, and everyone is exposed, particularly big companies, are exposed to data breach risk. Um, if 90% uh, if of your databases hold the data um, in, in, in uh, anonymized form, then that reduces your, your exposure to data breach quite a lot. And this is what uh, one of the things that, um, that the legislation refers to as data protection by design and by default. So, you know, in the, uh, as far as possible, and I think that's very doable as well, keep data in, a, in a, an identifiable form only when necessary and to the extent necessary. So, yeah, so uh, the, the, uh, the title to this slide is, I believe, close to a verbatim quote out of GDPR. What's your obligation to provide security for your data? It's, you must have appropriate technical and organizational measures to ensure a level of security appropriate to the risk posed to personal data. Relatively qualitative, huh? Um, <clears throat> and the, this is where there is probably a fair amount of mirror image in the, the process for complying with GDPR as we are seeing here in the U.S. on uh, data breach uh, issues, and let me explain that. Um, companies that we work with that have the unfortunate uh, experience of a data breach, uh, they are being asked to account for how did this happen, right? And, and uh, the, you can do 99 things right, but the one thing that didn't get done right uh, will be the one that will be seized upon to say, well, why didn't you have, for example, better training uh, so when somebody had a phishing um, experiment with uh, one of your employees, they, they didn't spot it, and as a result, that not adequately trained employee disclosed all sorts of uh, personal uh, information uh, unwittingly. Um, so if you tick off uh, the, the key issues here, and that's all we can do today, but sort of ask yourself, would, do we have the right policies and procedures? Do we have access control? Seems pretty straightforward, but but I think as you go through the exercise of determining where, what personal data do we collect, where does it go, who has access to it, I think that will sharpen significantly um, your ability to protect that data. Uh, the rest is relatively straightforward, and uh, I'm going to uh, come back to one issue uh, on, on data breaches in a, uh, when we talk about that in a second, but, uh, but to echoing Ron's point, because it it's can't be overemphasized and made earlier, the more you can anonymize that data, the more you can encrypt that data. So even if someone gets into your system, the access to the data is meaningless, uh, the, the more protected you will be. So um, we mentioned uh, the e-privacy regulation. That, in terms of uh, structurally, this is separate from GDPR, although it's the same subject matter. And also in terms of uh, legislation, legislative process, whereas uh, the GDPR um, 
was passed uh, at the um, European Parliament uh, two years ago, uh, the e-privacy regulation was only published, um, I think, uh, early this year, in January, and uh, with the ambition of uh, bringing it uh, uh, into effect um, uh, by May um, um, 2018 next year, uh, in line with GDPR. The, a lot of the language, and for, for example, the enforcement powers are exactly the same as uh, GDPR. The e-privacy regulation is a, is a, I only can talk about that for a minute because uh, it, it really is something that, uh, that, that warrants a, a full um, um, presentation, a full uh, uh, focus. Um, it, it is a recast of an existing regulation. Um, but uh, in the existing regulation, mainly it is the laws about uh, marketing communications. You need consent, and people can withdraw their consent. This is about marketing communication. So this uh, this is still not law. It is still in draft, but uh, it, it, it was approved by the European Parliament. Um, and it expands the, 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 uh, the scope not just in terms of... Uh, uh, the kind of technologies and situations where the um, um, anti-spamming regulations apply, the, the, but, but much more importantly, in very, very um, <coughs> significant restrictions on uh, the use of uh, metadata. And if anyone knows anything about how um, um, digital uh, um, operations work, um, metadata uh, is, uh, is king. And, and, and this is basically saying, uh, it's not enough that you get consent for accessing uh, users' uh, metadata, talking particularly about the digital industry and, and use of uh, um, digital devices. You have to you have, to have uh, a justification uh, for using that metadata in terms of delivering your services. So, and, and, and the other nice thing is that you cannot make uh, consent for the use of the metadata, for example, uh, geolocation data, um, a condition for your service. So you can't tell people, uh, we'll, we, 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 we'll give you that service only if you give us access to your geolocation data. Now, you can imagine this is really important, and it flows into another major business issue, which is uh, targeted advertising. Now, for Google and Facebook and uh, I think Twitter and other things, other companies, uh, targeted advertising is the, the main um, business model. That is what they see the future um, of, of their uh, revenue in targeted advertising. The e-privacy regulation with its uh, restrictions on, on accessing and use of uh, metadata uh, could kill that business mo model or make it really, really difficult to, um, to work. So there you go. Um, engagement with regulators, I'll just say one thing about it, is that, again, as I said earlier, the level of engagement with regulators will depend a lot on, on the uh, level of risk. That, that's basically the only thing you need to, 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 to remember. So children, um, those who are familiar with children's privacy in the US know we have COPPA, Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. We've had it for a long time. This GDPR brings Europe into closer um, situation to the US, um, although the starting point is that you need parental consent for kids under 16, but different member states can uh, lower that. So it's very similar to uh, the US. The only thing I would say that's a little bit different is that they've put out statements by the regulators that basically say, we don't think you should be doing profiling of children at all. So if you are, then we would want to look at that very closely and, and work with you to get the consent, or consider whether the consent really would work. In terms of uh, exporting data outside of the EU, um, this is um, the same concept, by the way, applies in other countries that have uh, um, uh, quite developed uh, um, data protection regulations. Um, the, the point here is, is not to allow people to escape uh, the regulation by, by transferring the data outside of the jurisdiction. So in a way, it's an anti-avoidance issue. Um, and... Uh, it, 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 it's, it's not not allowed. It is a requirement to put in place certain safeguards when you transfer data outside of the EU that would ensure that, uh, um, by and large, um, the, 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 the legal rights of data subjects would continue to apply even when the data is outside of the EU and no one is subject to the jurisdiction. So um, this is what Safe Harbor was all about. If, if those of you who were in this, uh, Safe Harbor was all about uh, complying with the requirement to 
um, um, not to transfer data outside of the EU without putting in place safe, uh, uh, safeguards. So Safe Harbor was that safeguard. Uh, because of some issues that are not particularly important at the moment, the European Court of Justice uh, invalidated Safe Harbor, and uh, instead, um, after a lot of hard work, the, the US and the EU came up with the uh, very complicated uh, EU-US privacy shield, uh, which is the um, 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 scheme that replaces Safe Harbor. It's more complicated, it's more onerous, and I think less companies are taking it up. And the, the main issue, the main mechanism that is used today uh, to transfer data outside of the EU is um, the mod model contractual clauses. These seem to work very well, and for large groups, uh, the, the equivalent of that is the binding comp corporate rules. The only pro problem with that is that it's currently under the same challenge um, uh, through the courts that uh, data that, that uh, Safe Harbor uh, was um, two or three years ago. Um, and there's a fair chance that the European Court of Justice will decide that the uh, model clauses don't work, but at the moment they do work, so that's what we are using. If they don't work, we are in serious trouble. Uh, and then uh, just to note that uh, very recently the EU and the US under uh, Privacy Shield took a one-year retrospective look at how it's functioning and they deemed it to be adequate. Um, so you have a disconnect in some ways between the European Union Court of Justice, which thinks everything is inadequate frankly, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, what the EU regulators are saying, you know, it's, it's not perfect, but it's, we're, we're, we're comfortable with Privacy Shield. So I think there, are, there is some encouraging news, and w how that ultimately gets resolved, I'm not sure. No, no one knows. I, I never anticipated myself, I admit, <clears throat> that uh, the court would invalidate uh, Safe Harbor. I thought it was a, an extremely surprising decision, but that's what they decided, and the same thing could surprisingly happen with, uh, with uh, model clauses, but uh, we'll see. It is an issue because data flows um, is, is part of free trade. Basically, if you can't have uh, data flows between jurisdictions, then that really restricts trade. Um, so we, we have uh, a few minutes left. We can't get into a lot of depth on uh, d data breach preparedness in the context of the GDPR, but three things to note. Um, you really, uh, to be GDPR compliant, we'll need to have an incident response plan, one that you, you can, can, can not just have on paper or so, on some file. Uh, the, the essential element of an incident response plan, not just in its execution, but I would su suggest to you in how you put one together, is the members of the incident response team, that you have to have uh, ownership of that incident response process from all potentially affected areas of, of your organization. And, and you have to practice it. The tabletop exercise is, is essential. And no more so than GDPR. You, many of you probably have heard the, the, the timeline for reporting a breach under GDPR is 72 hours. Um, I, I do a lot of incident response work. It, right now, it takes the better part of two months before our forensic consultants can come back and say, here's what happened, and here's what got compromised. So 72 hours is less than two months. Uh, so <laughs> we, had a, we have a problem. Uh, now, the, 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 the good news is that it's the supervisory authority uh, which has to be notified within 72 hours. You have a little bit more time uh, before you have to notify uh, the, uh, uh, the yeah, and you can do it in phases as well. So uh, there, if you have uh, uh, an incident, be ready to go. And the only way you can be ready to go is to have an incident response plan, and the team have practice it. Um, communicating the data subject that's covered by Article 34. We don't have time to get to get into details of it, uh, but but there is a, a more generous lead time, and there is a process you can look at as to whether or not you even it's even triggered. Um, the, a couple of quick things here. Uh, again, you have to see what, what happened in that breach and keeping a record of what, of what you've done uh, to, to investigate and respond to it is essential. Um, I think we're going to talk about the last. Yeah, so I think we'll just wrap up here. Um, but as you're thinking, you know, especially if you're just getting started with GDPR <laughs> compliance, it's important to keep in mind that Europe is not the only country that regulates privacy, and if you're about to do a big um, revision of how you're dealing with people's information, you may want to think about what other countries uh, 
you should be thinking about as well and look at those and see to the extent you can do the same thing and comply with multiple jurisdictions. Um, obviously, complying with GDPR or being ready to will be a competitive advantage for you. You'll have potentially more customers, you'll have potentially more business partners who are willing to work with you, and you will avoid the big fines. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, in respecting your time, please feel free. Um, if anybody wants to have a general question, pose it now. Otherwise, we'll be here for a few minutes to, to follow up. Thank you. <laughs>